Well, as you take your copy of the Word of God, and if you'll find the book of 2 Thessalonians, let's take a moment and ask the Lord to speak to us. I think we're going to look at a gospel issue today that we don't really think about very much, that has very significant implications in how we live our life. But it's also one of those things, unless God helps us to see it, we, we may not be able to see it. So let's ask for added grace this morning. Father, as we come to the Scriptures and we lay our life before the truth of the Word of God, we believe it to be the living Word that is profitable to teach us truth, to correct us in our sin, but also to train us in what it looks like to, to live and walk in righteousness. And that's what this text has the power to do today. Father, we just confess that it's our sin nature that wants to make our ears dull, it's our sin nature that wants to deflect this and say this is for someone else and not for me. So we confess that and we ask for your grace to give us ears to hear. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, for the last 12 weeks, we have been walking through Paul's letter, two letters to the church at Thessalonica. And today we finally come to the end of this series. But uh, don't lose hope. We will have church next week. Uh, in fact, I just want to introduce, next week we start a new sermon series called The Story of the Cross. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. You know, we spend a lot of time on Christmas, and we know the stories of Christmas pretty well, primarily because there's not very many of them. There's the Magi, the Shepherds, Joseph, Mary, the Angel, the Manger. And then we spend a whole month talking about these stories over and over every year, and the result is we learn the stories of Christmas really well. But when it comes to Easter because we compress everything into just one week called Holy Week, uh, we don't really learn the stories of Easter very, very well. So what I want us to do as a church, I want us to know the story of the cross just as well as we know the story of the manger. And so on Palm Sunday, we're going to begin, and we're going to follow the Gospel of Matthew, beginning with the triumphal entry, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem for the last week of his life. And we're just going to walk very slowly and looking at all the details of not only the last week of his life, but the crucifixion and the resurrection, all the way through the ascension, just through the ending of the Gospel of Matthew. So that begins next Sunday on Palm Sunday, the story of the cross. Uh, but today we come to this last portion of Scripture, Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica. And this is a great example of why it is so important that we accurately handle the Word of God. Because I can tell you what's going to happen. We're, we're going to read this text, and there's going to be a line that jumps out at you. And you're going to say, oh, I've heard that before. I didn't know where that was, but there it is. Uh, and our temptation is to take this phrase and just to rip it out of Scripture and ignore the context and just start applying it at all sorts of places that we can without ever slowing down into actually trying to accurately handle the Word of God. So we have to slow down and say, what does the text say? What was Paul trying to communicate to the church in Thessalonica? And then once we understand that, then we can take it to our own life and say, well, how do we respond obediently to this in light of what we have read in Scripture? So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 6 as we read through verse 15. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies, and now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly, to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him, so that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him, though, as an enemy, but warn him as a brother." Again, our natural instinct is to see that phrase in verse 10. That's the statement that jumps out at us. If anyone's not willing to work, let him not eat. 
And we just kind of pull it out of the context and we just kind of run with it. And we begin to apply it in different ways. And we just kind of ignore what Paul is talking about. So let me just go ahead and say what I think Paul is going after here. I think Paul is trying to give the church in Thessalonica, the Christians in Thessalonica, a gospel understanding of this thing called work. That they came out of a culture, remember they, they had to deny other gods and serve the living and true God, and they came out of a culture that did not understand what the cross has to do with work, but now that they are followers of Christ, he's saying to them, this is what it looks like to have a gospel understanding of work. The problem that he's addressing in verse 6 is that there is a brother who is walking in idleness. Now, idleness is the word, almost all English translations use this word, idleness. I think it's an unfortunate word because when we think of idleness, we think of not doing anything, maybe even being lazy. But I don't think that's the real issue here. Really what Paul was talking about is someone who's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and because of that, they are beginning to do something that they're not supposed to be doing. The word literally means disordered or out of order. Disordered. The brother who is walking out of order. It's only used in the New Testament in these two letters, but when you look at other Greek writers who are contemporaries of Paul and they use this word, they most often were describing disorder on the battlefield. They were warning those who refused to fight alongside their fellow soldiers. They were walking in a toktos. They were being disordered. They were not following orders. They were negligent in the performance of their duties. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were not following the traditions that they had received. They were walking in a toktos. And I'm going to keep using this word atoktos because I, I think idol doesn't capture the heart of it. And I want us to keep hammering out what is Paul talking about. So when we think of idol, we think of not doing anything. That's not what Paul's talking about here in atoktos. atoktos. He's saying you're not doing what God has called you to do. And as a result of that, you risk that you're now starting to do that which you should not do. Now, whatever atoktos means, I hope you realized when you read that passage... All of the Christian community language that surrounds whatever a taktos is. He's, he's writing this to brothers. And this is the phrase that he uses over and over in these two letters. It means brothers and sisters. It's talking about fellow siblings in the household of faith. This individual who's walking in a taktos is a fellow brother, is a fellow believer. He is commanding him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Later on in verse 12, again, he encourages in the Lord Jesus Christ to, to not walk in a taktos. Then he says in verse 14, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him. This is church discipline language. This is in the context of Christian community. And then he says, don't regard him as an enemy, but, but warn him as a brother. So whatever Paul is talking about here, this is within the, the church community. This is not speaking to a citizen in relationship to the government in terms of governmental social welfare. Now, as in with all wisdom, wisdom can be applied in multiple places. But Paul's context here is not about a government welfare system. This is an issue of Christian discipleship. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ when it comes in the relationship to work? And so he begins to describe a toktos. What does it mean to walk in a toktos? You notice in verse 7, Paul says, we gave you an example and our example is what it looks like to not walk in a toktos. When we were with you, he says, we were not idle. We were not a toktos. We were not doing this. And so what did we do? We did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But we toiled and labored and worked night and day for the reason that we might not be a burden to you. So we're starting to get a clear picture of what does it look like to not walk in a toktos, Paul says, to work so that you are not a burden to someone else. And evidently, this was important to Paul because not only does he say it in the second letter, but he also says it in the first letter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, You remember our labor and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So Paul says, this is our example. When we were there with you, we worked hard. But the reason was, we didn't want to be a burden to others when we could carry our own burden. As he continues to that, he gets to verse 11 and says, We hear that some of you are walking in a toktos, 
you're not, and then the ESV says, busy at work, but you are busy bodies. And most of our English translations want to catch that word play between busy and busy. The Greek literally, Greek literally just says you're not working, but instead you're being a busybody. Now, what does this great word busybody mean? Busybody is one of these words that it's hard for us to define it, but we kind of know what it is. Can't put it into words, but you can point to someone and say, yeah, that's it right there. The, the English definition of busybody is to bustle about uselessly, to busy oneself about trifling, needless, useless matters, to volunteer one's services where they, where they were neither asked nor needed. <laughs> Don't you like that? To volunteer your services where no one asked you or no one needs you. Uh, the Latin for this is you stick your nose where it doesn't belong. It's not Latin. I just made that part up. But that's we understand that, right? It is meddlesome. In other words, you're not fulfilling your own responsibilities, but you are now beginning to meddle in other people as they're trying to perform their responsibilities. So instead of walking in a taktos, you are start to be a busybody. And so instead of that, Paul says in verse 12, this is what we're encouraging you to do. And he says to work quietly. It's interesting, when Paul talks about work in these two letters, he connects quietly and work quite often. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 11, uh, aspire to live quietly, mind your own affairs, work with your hands as we instructed you. This idea of work and quietness. I think whatever it means uh, to be a work, do your work quietly means to mind your own business, not be a business, busybody, take care of your own responsibilities, stop meddling with your words and what other people's responsibilities are. And Paul says, earn your own living at the end of verse 12. So he takes his example, we did not eat the bread that we didn't pay for, and he makes that positive. He says, eat your own bread, uh, work for your own uh, bread, provide for your own living, earn your own living. Uh, I've always heard that the problem in Thessalonica, see if you've heard this before, is that the Christians in Thessalonica were so expecting that Jesus was going to return any minute now, that they decided, hey, we can just quit our jobs, sit on the front porch in a lawn chair with a Diet Coke, and Jesus will be here before the end of the week. Why should we be working and messing with this? Jesus is going to be here tomorrow, right? Y'all heard that before? That kind of makes logical sense, I guess, but I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. Notice in the first letter, Atoktos is already a problem. He says in chapter 5, admonish the Atoktos, admonish the idol. And in 1 Thessalonians, he's already given the example of work. He says, notice our example. We worked among you so that we would not be a burden to someone else. So that already seems to be an issue. I think the problem in the church was there was something about the culture of Thessalonica that either made it okay or even admirable to not work, but to allow for others to meet your needs. Most scholars seem to think this was the Roman system of patronage. And I don't know that we want to spend 10 minutes chasing down that rabbit. But there was just something about the culture where you could not work and allow someone else to meet your needs. And what Paul is saying is when you come from out of that pagan culture and into the church, the cross changes that. The gospel changes our understanding of work. And he wants to give this, the Christians here a gospel understanding of work. And did you notice how serious this is? Paul says this is an issue worthy of breaking Christian fellowship. He says that twice. He says in verse 14, take note of that person and have nothing to do, do with them. But also in verse 6, keep away from that brother. That's pretty serious. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm you know, starting preparing to preach this is going to be our text and reading this and realizing, okay, this is the main point. And then you begin to think, I mean, do we really need to devote an entire Sunday to the gospel understanding of work? Is it that important? Well, it was important to Paul. Paul thought this was a serious enough issue that if you misunderstood it, it was worthy of breaking Christian fellowship. So if it's that significant of an issue, then we need to understand that. Uh, and again, Paul says, look, if if you've got someone walking in a taktos, don't regard him as an enemy in verse 15, but warn him as a brother. He's painting a picture of one Christian sitting down with another Christian saying, look, you're not understanding the gospel. 
If you understand the gospel as it relates to work, it changes our, our attitude and our practice of work, and so admonish and encourage them to understand about work. Which brings us back to verse 10. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. I just In the context, Paul is not talking about the governmental welfare system. He's really talking about the church welfare system. So if you read the book of Acts in the early church, we know that the church was providing food for those who were not able to provide food for themselves. So in Acts chapter 4, we already see the picture that people were selling property and giving it to the apostles so that no one was in need. You get to Acts chapter 6, and there is this daily distribution of food for the widows in Jerusalem. And part of the problem was that the Greek widows were being overlooked, and so they had to appoint the deacons to make sure that everyone was being served. You get to 1 Timothy. Paul writes Timothy and says, when the church enrolls widows who are in need, this is the criteria. So make sure that the church is the only burdened to take care of those who really need to be taken care of. So there was this church welfare system, if you want to use that phrase, so to speak. And what Paul was saying is, if someone is not willing to work, the church shouldn't feel the burden of providing food for them. If they're walking in a toctos and they're not willing to work, then the church shouldn't feel the burden of providing for them. This is total separate conversation from the Roman government's safety welfare net. I mean, we it's pretty well known the Roman government had a a social welfare, they would dole out free grain and corn. Um, estimates are in the first century in the city of Rome that the Roman government was providing either free or subsidized grain to anywhere between 10 to 20 percent of the population of Rome. So the, the Roman government had a welfare distribution system, and all governments have tried to take care of the poor, and you wrestle between caring for the poor and discour- discouraging work, and all that conversation. That's just not what Paul's talking about. Here, Paul is talking about Christian discipleship. What does it look like to be a follower of Christ when it comes to the issue of work? And so let that be our focus this morning. And so you see in your bulletin just these five statements. What is a gospel understanding of work? Or how does the fact that we have come to be a follower of Christ change our attitude towards work? Because let's be honest, y'all did not come here this morning to hear a speech on government welfare reform, right? I didn't hear an amen, but I'm sure that was in your heart of hearts, right? You came here because you are a follower of Christ. You came here because you wanted to worship Jesus Christ. You came here because you want to grow and learn of what does it mean for me to be a follower of Christ. And this is what Paul was speaking of. So let's look and see what is a gospel understanding of work. And so these five statements. First gospel understanding of work is that work is an expression of love. Work really is an expression of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. I think it's very interesting that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Paul talks about work, he talks about work in the context of brotherly love. So look at 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 9 through 12. Now concerning brotherly love, You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Isn't that interesting that the idea of work is put in a context of brotherly love? I mean, verse 11, aspire to work quietly, mind your own affairs, work with your hands. That's what they're doing more and more. In verse 10, this is what you're doing, which is how you were taught to love, love one another. Work is an expression of love. It is a loving thing to your neighbor to not ask your neighbor to carry a burden that you're able to carry yourself and that's your burden to carry. That is an expression of love. Paul also adds to this in the book of Ephesians He says in Ephesians 4, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So not only is work loving because we're not asking others to carry a burden that we should be carrying ourselves, but work is an expression of love because when we work, we gather resources so that we can help those who do need help and who are not able to provide for themselves. In other words, work is a discipleship issue. 
Because at the very core of being a disciple is following the first and second greatest commandment. And the second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And work is a way that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Paul's trying to give them a gospel understanding of work. You just don't go punch a clock. There might not have been a lot of clocks to punch in Thessalonica, but you get the expression, right? You just don't go do your job. There's a purpose. It is an expression of love. You are loving your neighbor as you love yourself because you're not forcing them to carry your burden that you can carry, and you're also working to earn something that you can share with those who are not able to carry their own burden. Second thing Paul says, he says that work is good. Work is good. In verse 13, he says, do not grow weary in doing good. Now, if we just take that out of context, it can mean all sorts of things, but it's in the middle of a context of talking about a taktos. And I think what Paul is saying here is he's writing to those in the church who are not walking in a taktos. They are working to provide for their own food. And for those of you who've ever had a job, work gets a little wearying at times, right? And if you start looking at other people who are not working and just kind of floating and making it, how tempting is it to say, well, why am I working? That life over there looks much easier. And so Paul says, hey, don't grow weary of doing good. Those of you who are not walking in the tacos, but you're working, and you're working so you can carry your own burden, and you're working so that you have something to share, that's good. Don't grow weary in doing good. But I think it's important for us just to hear Paul say that work is good. Work is good. And he talks so often about working with your hands. You know, manual labor is something often that either we look down upon, or at least we think that We want to climb the ladder enough so we no longer have to do that. Or if we're really lucky, we can climb the ladder high enough so we don't have to work at all, right? Isn't that kind of the dream? I just want to get rich enough so my money works for me and I no longer have to work for my money. Work is seen by our sin nature as something we want to escape as opposed to something that is good by definition. Even when you stop working for compensation we still work. The value of our work is not decided by how much you are compensated for it. The value of our work is do we use our resources, our energy, our time, and our talents to help other, to bear our own burdens and to help others bear their burdens when they can't carry it themselves. I mean, a lot of our work we don't get compensated for. Can I get an amen for single moms, stay-at-home moms, right? You don't get paid for that. Uh, what about those who have retired and you no longer have to, to work for your bread because your retirement's doing that, but you're still working to carry the burdens of others. It's called volunteer work, but you're using your resources, your time and energy to help others who are not able to bear their burdens and help carry that. You are working. There's a lot of work that we do that we are not paid for. The value of it is not that we're compensated for it. The value of it is that we're using our resources, our time, our energy, and our talent to bear our own burdens and also to help those who cannot bear their own. So work is an expression of love. Work in itself is good. And the third thing, and this is really the most important thing, is that work radiates the gospel. It radiates the gospel. This is one of Paul's concerns, particularly you see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that you walk properly before outsiders. Paul says, if you've got someone in your community that's walking in a taktos, that is discrediting the gospel, and that is giving a false picture of who Jesus is. Because Paul knew what was going on in Thessalonica. There's this small group of believers who are the church. And the rest of the culture is looking at this. What is this Jesus thing? What is this church? What is this community? What does it look like to follow this Jesus? And if they look at this group and what they see is a bunch of uh, people walking in a taktos, and they're not bearing their own burdens, and they're letting for other people carry their burdens, and then when they have someone in need in their own community, they're not willing to lift a finger or put forth any effort to care at all, the, the rest of the world would look at that and say, well, why would I want to be a part of that? Well, where, where's the, the joy of being there? But more importantly, Paul knew that if we walk in a talk dose, we are giving people a very poor picture of Jesus. The gospel message could be basically stated stated like this, that Jesus worked so that he could carry other people's burdens. If you think about it, 
Are you working to memorize our bulletin scripture memory verses? Philippians chapter 2, memorizing that whole section. There's a whole lot of words there if you're trying to memorize it. I feel for you uh, because I'm struggling as well. But isn't that a picture of Jesus working to carry the burdens of others? Here's Jesus in the form of God did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. But what did he do? He emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant so that he could bear our burdens, a burden that we could not bear, the burden of sin. He took that on the cross. He worked to bear a burden that we could not bear on our own. Another passage of Scripture says that he became poor so that we might become rich. And so when we walk in a taktos, we are giving the world a false vision of what Jesus is, what Jesus did. Jesus worked to carry your burden. And when you work, you are radiating the gospel that says, I am using my resources, my time, my energy, my talent, not only to carry my own burden, but to help other people carry their burden as well, because that is what Jesus did for me. We are radiating the gospel. So work is an expression of love. Work is good. It's not something to try to get out of, but work is good. Work radiates the gospel. And then number four, eventually work serves one kingdom or another. You're going to use your resources and time and energy and talent to serve one kingdom or another. You're either going to serve the kingdom of God or you're going to begin to serve the kingdom of self and the kingdom of this world. That's why he says, if you're not working, what are you doing? You're being a busybody. If you're not doing your responsibilities, you're going to start meddling in other people's responsibility because it is nearly impossible to stay neutral. That's why I think idle is not the best word here. It's not what he's talking about. Uh, We are going to use that to serve some kingdom. So if you think about it, work is really a form of spiritual warfare. I mean, you've all heard the expression, idle hands are the work of the the devil or the devil's playthings or whatever form you've seen that quote. It really is spiritual warfare. It is warfare against the enemy because the enemy wants you to stop doing what God has called you to do and begin to do uh, busybody things or chase the kingdom of self or the kingdom of this world. So work serves one kingdom or another. We need to make sure it's serving the kingdom of Christ. And then just finally, that number five, Atoktos is, is a serious discipleship issue. This is serious discipleship. We need a good theology of work as we make disciples. So we need to make disciples who understand that work is a way that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We need to make disciples who understand that work is something good to be embraced, not to be avoided. We need to make disciples that see that work radiates the gospel of Jesus, working to bear the burdens of others. And we need to make disciples who understand that work really is a form of spiritual warfare, to do everything that we do to the glory of God. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it to the glory of God. So as we close this morning, just a few final words here. (coughs) Excuse me. We, We definitely should not be using this passage to shame those who want to work, but they can't. Whether they can't because of a disability or they can't for some other reason, but their heart wants to work, this is not to be used as a hammer to shame people. Who This is about those who can work, but they don't want to. They're walking in a talk to us. We need to make sure of that. Secondly, when we read this, we, we shouldn't just be thinking about those on the lower end of the economic scale. And we tend to think about these uh, and we think of the, the poor who are not willing to work. But you know, in a prosperous culture, this has a has strong word for those on the other end. We have an entire segment of our population that no longer needs to work for their food. So now what should they be doing with their resources, their time, and their energy? We still ought to be at work, right, as a gospel expression, even if we no longer have to work for our bread. And so it really speaks to all spectrums of the economy as well. But I want to just walk away thinking, this is a discipleship issue. So parents and grandparents, this is why you teach your children a gospel view of work. Teach your kids a gospel understanding of why they should pick up their toys. And why should your kids pick up their toys? It's not just because you don't want to step on a Lego at 3 o'clock in the morning which no one wants to do, right? But a four-year-old picks up their toys 
so that that toy is not a burden to another member of the family. You pick up your toy as an expression of love. You are loving your neighbor as you love yourself. I'm not requiring another member of my family to pick up this toy. I do it as an expression of love for them. Why should I pick up my sibling's toy? Because that's what Jesus did for us. He, he bore our burdens on the cross. And the way that we embrace Jesus is we bear the burdens of others. And so, yes, we should delight and pick up the toys of our siblings because we're bearing other people's burdens. And we need to give a, a theological understanding to work as we train up our children. And when they go through those teenage years where every time you ask them to do something, they say, do I have to? Okay, right? That is everybody's sin nature saying what our sin nature wants to say. Our sin nature does not want to work for the glory of God. And just understand that. That's why you are discipling your children. That's why you're discipling yourself, is to give a gospel understanding to your sin nature that says, do I have to? And say, yes, because work is an expression of love. This is the way we love our neighbors, we love ourselves. This radiates the gospel of Jesus Christ. This shows to the world what Jesus has done for us. This is why we should embrace that. So make sure when you're making disciples of your kids, that you give them a gospel understanding of work, why they do what they do. Now, there may come a time we have to have tough conversations with our brothers and sisters in Christ within our church who are walking in a talk toast. And if we, we have those opportunities or God calls us to that, you know, we need to have a little bit more depth and stop being lazy, go get a job. Uh, maybe that works on the outside, but in the church, there's a deeper reason to have that conversation. If you're a follower of Christ, understand that work has a significantly different value for followers of Jesus. It is a way that we love our neighbors. It is a way that we radiate the gospel uh, and just have some depth to it. But as we close today, let me just ask you this question. How does this passage of Scripture challenge you as a disciple of Christ in your view of work? You can go to work every day and still have a pretty poor theology of work. If you go to work, and you're miserable, and you go to work and you make everyone miserable around you who's got to work with you being miserable, that's not a good theology of work. You may have worked eight hours, you may have done your, your job well, but that's not a Christian understanding of what we're called to as work. Are we radiating the gospel? as we carry out our job assignment where we work? Are we understanding that the reason that we are doing what we're doing is we are loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, to carry our own burdens, to earn something so that we can share with those who can't carry their own burdens? Do we understand that work itself is good because God created it to be good? So how does this passage challenge you in terms of your understanding as a follower of Christ? Let's pray together.